my message is titled this, Embrace Wisdom. Embrace Wisdom. And I want to tell you that the Bible yields its riches to those who hunger for it. The Bible yields its riches to those who hunger for it. And God wants his word to be honored. And he hides his truths from the hypocrites. He hides it from them. There are things that people will use, things that people will use from Scripture, and they don't understand the truth of what they're talking about. Why? Because God hides it from them. But to you who have a hunger for his word, he will reveal it to you. Someone said, well, what's the best way for me to study the Bible? Can I use this method or that method? Listen, open up your Bible. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you, to give you a, a, a ram of word, to illuminate that word for you, and he will reveal it to you. Well, I want to study my Bible. I want to get more out of it. How hungry are you for it? How hungry are you for it? You know, I told someone one time, I said, if you don't read your Bible for a few days, you shouldn't feel guilty. You should feel hungry. And God reveals his truth to those who hunger for it. In the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom, chapter 2 and verse 7, it says this. It says, he layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He layeth it up for the righteous, but he also lays it up from the world. So if you are in Christ, if you are a believer, if you are a child of God, there is sound wisdom for you that the world does not have. Where is it found? In his word. It's found in his word. But remember this, as I said before, someone that's a scholar, someone that's not, they're a worldly scholar, they're not a believer, can read the same scripture that you read but guess what? The truths and the riches will not be revealed to them. But you who are working and you work at, at Walmart or you change tires or you work as an accountant, guess what? You don't have all the accolades. You don't have all the degrees. You don't have no, the knowledge of Hebrew and Greek and everything. But guess what? God reveals the riches to you. Amen? Amen. And so today I'm talking about wisdom. You see, the world is learning more and more about less and less. And eventually, they'll know everything about nothing. I know that that sounds funny, and it is funny, but it's true. It's true. Look at what people are going in and studying now. You go into the university, and you study social sciences, or you study this or that. or the, You study all these different things, and it's, you're learning more and more about less and less. And really, what you're studying, does it really matter? Or it's, it's, the Bible says this. It says, professing to be wise, they become fools. And you know, there are a lot of intellectual fools out there today. And I won't name any, but there are a lot of intellectual fools out there. But I'm telling you something. This verse will work in reverse. Professing to be fools, they become wise. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, those who truly say, in and of myself, there is not wisdom. There's not wisdom. I don't have the wisdom that I need. I don't have what I need to do this, Lord. I don't have it. But in Christ, I am wise. They become so. You see, you profess, you profess Christ, that is wisdom. You profess him, that is wisdom. And I want to say this this morning, the most important teaching we can have is God's word. It's the most important thing that we can learn about more than any other education, more than any. For the greatest education you can have is to know the Lord. And this is coming from a teacher, a school teacher who has, who has spent many years in education. But I will tell you, the greatest education you can have is to know the Lord. And today, Especially today, in today's world, the church needs to be full of people who are full of the wisdom of God. Amen? We need to be full of people who are full of the wisdom of God. Do not cease to pray for wisdom. 
Do not cease to pray for wisdom as the Bible says. Do not cease. Ask God continuously. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. I want you to look, if you have your Bibles, we'll stay in the book of Proverbs, but we're going to move to chapter 3 and beginning in verse 13 today. Proverbs 3, verse 13 starts out and it says this, Happy is the man who finds wisdom. How many of you are happy this morning? If you're not happy, you haven't found wisdom. No, I'm just, but happy is the man who finds wisdom. And the man who gains understanding. For the, her proceeds are better than the profits of silver, and her gain than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. Length of days is in her right hand, in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who retain her. I want you to notice something about this passage. We find wisdom, and from this we gain understanding. We find wisdom, and we gain understanding understanding. You see, the world has this in reverse. The world tries to gain understanding without first finding wisdom, and this leaves them unhappy. It leaves them empty. It leaves them seeking. It leaves them searching, but never coming to any sound conclusion. Isn't this the way that science works? They have theories, but theories are theories because they are theoretical. I know that's deep, right? But this means they always have a chance, there's a chance that it could be proven wrong. How long was Pluto a planet, right? And then all of a sudden, no longer is it a planet. And people say, well, I think it's still a planet. And other people say, no, it's not a planet. Theories. Gravity. The theory of gravity, right? What goes up must come down. But you know what I'm saying? Gravity's a theory. Guess what? Every day, thousands of planes defy gravity. The theory of gravity. The plane goes up, but it can stay up and keep staying up as long as it has fuel to stay up and it comes down. Yes, there's a force that pulls on it. Gravity but it can be defied. It's a theory. It's a theory. I think of music theory. Not my favorite courses in college, but music theory. Guess what? There are rules. But some of the greatest composers broke the rules of music theory to make masterful compositions. So in theory, the theories are just theories. And that's what I'm trying to get you to understand today. And this is why wisdom and understanding is more profitable than silver, gold, and rubies. Because with all the world's resources, the world lives in a limbo. They never arrive on anything sound. They never come to a place of security. The book of 2 Timothy says they are always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. The truth. Well, these are the facts. This is the truth. There's a difference between a fact and the truth. The fact is that Jesus Christ should not have been able to come out of the grave after he was crucified and dead for three days. But the truth is he came out of the grave after he was crucified and dead for three days. Do you understand what I'm saying? Facts and truth are not the same thing. The facts can change. And when the facts change, it changes the trajectory of the end, right? But the truth cannot change. The truth will not change. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And the Bible says he is the same today, yesterday, and forever, Un 
changing. The truth is unchanging. It doesn't matter if you try to change it in your textbooks. It doesn't matter if you try to change it in the rhetoric of the media. The truth is the truth, and it shall not change. It shall forever be. Amen. But think about the things the world desires. Knowledge, power, money, influence. But none of this matters when it's based on a foundation that can fail and fall at any moment. Because I'll tell you something, what man desires most is peace and assurance. That's why he desires knowledge, power, money, and influence because he thinks that knowledge, power, money, and influence will give him peace and assurance. But let me tell you something. Let me give you a hint before you spend your whole life going after it. It won't. It won't give you those things. It will not give you those things. How many people had money in the bank and the Great Depression hit? Where did their peace go? It was gone. No more peace. We're rushing to the bank to draw out what's there. There's a run on the bank. That's not peace. There is nothing that can bring you peace without the Prince of Peace. Nothing. But when you have the Prince of Peace, you have peace. The Bible says you have the peace of God and you have peace with God. And those are the two most important things that you can have because everything else can fall apart. Everything else can fall apart, and it does. I was talking with with. Uh, Brother Shane before service and he says this is falling apart and that's falling apart and this is happening and I've been there and you've been there but you know what never fails and never falls apart is the peace of God that passes all understanding. When we ask the Lord to give us wisdom, wisdom embraces us. Wisdom wraps her arms around us. Notice in this verse that wisdom is referred to in a feminine way. Now, a lot would say that this is because in the Hebrew language, wisdom is actually grammatically feminine. In some languages, you have masculine and feminine tenses, okay? English is a little bit different, but you have masculine and feminine. And so in Hebrew, wisdom is a feminine tense. But I believe that God is giving us the idea. Remember, those riches are given to the righteous. The riches are given to those who hunger for the word. The world sees it as a feminine tense, but I see something more there. What I see is this. God is giving us the idea of taking hold of something dear. Taking hold of something dear. Men, when you kissed your wife on your wedding day, and you embraced her, you took hold of something dear. You took hold of something, and she took hold of you, and the arms wrapped around you, and you felt that embrace. And wisdom is the same way. And notice that in wisdom, it talks about her hands. Her right hand, it says, she has length of days in her right hand. And in her left hand, she has riches and honor. Now, let me tell you something. The right hand is the more important of the two. It's the more important. Whenever the man with the withered hand, Jesus healed him. He said, stretch forth your hand. I believe it was the right hand that was, that was crippled. And you know what that did? It didn't just heal the man's hand, but it enabled him, enabled him to work again enabled him to make money because the right hand is a position of authority. It's a position of power. And the most important thing in that right hand is length of days. Why do I say it's more important? Well, because you can have all the riches and all of the honor that you want, but if you're six feet under, what merit is it to you? What merit? So long life is to be valued over riches and honor. But when we have wisdom, riches and honor are part of the package. Do you understand that? 
it says that length of days is in her right hand and riches and honor are in her left. So you get the whole package. You know, many people, they spend the best years of their life trying to obtain wealth. And then they spend the final years of their life Spending their wealth, trying to buy back the health they spent obtaining the wealth. Did you catch that? Many people spend the best years of their life trying to obtain wealth. And then they spend the final years of their life spending their wealth to buy back the health they spent obtaining the wealth. And this is not what God wants us to do. God said, I want you to prosper. I want you to be in good health, even as your soul prospers. And see, when wisdom embraces us, when we embrace wisdom, her right hand and her left hand wrap around us. And we have in the right hand length of days. What is length of days? Long life. But not just long life. Quality life. There are a lot of people who live long lives, but not quality lives. Long life, but also quality life. You see, the believer has length of days. The believer has long quality life. The believer has riches. The believer has honor. And you could say, well, someone in the world... They could have left, lived a long life, and they could have had riches and honor. Yeah, but there's one thing that they don't have, and it is peace. It's peace. Because as I've said before, there is no peace without the prince of peace. You can have a, a, a deceptive form of peace. You can have a manufactured form of peace, but it's not peace without the prince of peace. The Bible says this about wisdom. All her paths are of peace. All her paths are of peace. Whenever you're walking through life and you're making decisions and you say, well, I just want to make sure that I have peace about it. Have you ever heard somebody say, I want, I want to have peace about this? Here's what I would tell you. All her paths are paths of peace. At, for a believer, you walk you walk in peace. If there's unrest, you pause. You see, a lot of times we want to say, well, the Lord will give me peace about this if he wants. No, you should be in peace. Peace should be what is, Jesus said, my peace I give to you, I leave to you. Peace that the world doesn't give, that passes all understanding. Your walk should be a walk of peace. I'm walking in peace. Here comes a decision. I have peace. Keep walking. I'm walking in peace. Here comes a decision. I have unrest. Stop. Stop. And don't spend too much time asking the Lord to give you peace about something where you have unrest. Because you have unrest because probably he doesn't want you to go that direction. Okay? Peace. Peace should be your that it should be where you are, are found your foundation should be peace that should be where you always are at something comes along peace should be your foundation that's your default setting her paths are paths of peace every path i walk with her there is peace now peace here is shalom it's not just being calm it's not just calm it's health it's wholeness, it's well-being, it's a blessed family and marital life. What's the value of peace? Can you put a price on it? Can I? Can I put a value on the peace of God that I have? That as I said before, when the whole world comes crashing down or seems to, that that peace of God is there. He walks you through. He holds your hand. He keeps you. He comforts you. He calms you. Can you put a price on that? No. How many would give their entire fortune, their entire portfolio, everything that they have just to have peace? 
peace in their family, peace in their mind, peace with God, the peace of God. You see, they have it all, but they do not have peace. They've acquired great wealth, but have unrest about the things they had to do to acquire it. They live a long life, but are always at unrest, trying to overcome sickness and disease. But you, child of God, can have peace, and along with it, all of the benefits of the wisdom of God. You see, God blesses you, and God gives to you wealth, and you are at peace giving it to others. Let me remind you of this. Maybe some of you remember the, the, it was kind of a thing. It was a, called Financial Peace University. It was a peace. It was an idea of getting out of debt, debt freedom, and having peace in your finances. Do you, does anyone remember that? It was a big thing in the church, and it helped people to become debt-free. And let me tell you something. There's nothing wrong with debt freedom. According to the Word of God, we shouldn't be in debt. The Bible says the borrower is a slave to the lender. And I understand this, but let me tell you something that wisdom has taught me. Debt freedom is not financial freedom. Debt freedom will not give you financial peace. Do you know how many people there are who are totally debt free? No debt. But every day they sit and they watch the market. Every day they look at their accounts. Every day they count their money. They struggle to give 10% to God. They hoard their money. They save up their money, wondering if they're going to have enough to live the next day and the next day and worrying and wondering, is that financial peace? Is that financial freedom? You know, there's a reason that money is called currency. It has to flow to operate. It has to flow to work. If it just sits there, there's no flow. You see, to me, financial freedom is having the peace in knowing that God will provide your needs. Financial freedom can be found even in the debtor who has a little who has a little, but chooses to give it to help someone in need. That's financial peace. To be able to say, Lord, you know this is what I have. You know these are the bills I have. You know these are the payments I have. And I see this person that's in need. Lord, you know this account. You know it. But you're telling me to help this person. And you know what? I have peace, God. I have peace that you're going to take care of me. And so you know what? Here it goes. Here it goes. Maybe some of you have been there before. You've been sitting in a service or something, and the Lord says, hey, I want you to give. And you open up your wallet, and you look in there, and you say, that's all I have in there. I've, had, I've, heard, I've heard people before say that they've, they've done things out of faith that God has asked them to do, and it's like I didn't even have it to give, and I gave it. Because they trusted the Lord, they had peace. You see, those who love people more than they love money are truly those who have financial freedom. Those who know that the Lord will take care of them, that, that he will provide for them all that they need. Those are the people who are financially free. Now, yes, I understand debt freedom. I understand that not having debts and not having a ton of, of, of things in the red causes you to be able to help others more. It gets you out of, of being, you know, a borrower. It gets you out of that state. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but what I'm saying is that there are people with millions of dollars in the bank who take their lives in their million-dollar mansions every day because they don't have peace. Remember this, as I've always said, people should never be used to attain wealth or obtain wealth, but wealth is given to serve others. If God blesses you, it's given to you for the reason of blessing and serving other people. And we have a giving church, amen? Man, we have a giving church. Thank God for that. Yes, God will bless you. It says that in her left hand are riches and honor. Now, I can't Make this more black and white for you. Riches and honor. And this isn't just spiritual things. I want you to look in the book of Genesis chapter 26 and verse 14. 
Genesis 26 and 14. It's talking about Isaac, Abraham's son. Now I want you to look at what it says of Isaac. It says this, For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. The people of the world, the Philistines, were jealous of Isaac. Why were they jealous? Because of his spiritual riches? These are people of the world. They don't, they don't look through spiritual eyes. They're looking at Isaac and they're jealous of him. Why are they jealous of him? Because of his material wealth. They saw what he had. Possessions of flocks, possessions of herds, a great store of servants. And the power that came with it. The king, Abimelech, he even told Isaac, he said, you have to leave this land because you've become too powerful. Now for a king to tell just a, a, a common man, you've got to leave this place because you've become too powerful. How? Did Isaac amass great armies? No. He had influence. He had possessions. He had flocks. He had herds. Really, Isaac, a servant of God, making a king feel uneasy uh, to the point where the king says, you got to get out of here. But I want you to see this. How did Isaac obtain the wealth that he had? How did he get it? Let me tell you, it was from the wisdom of God. It was from the wisdom of God. Because God told him to do something. God said there was a time of famine. I don't know if you know this about the story and where this is happening, but there was a time of famine. And it says that Isaac sowed in the year of famine. Now, most people would tell you, don't sow in the year of famine. What would they tell you to do? Store, right? Keep all that you have. Don't, don't do this with in the year of famine. You want to keep it because it's famine. But Isaac sowed in the year of famine. Why did he do that? Because God told him to sow in the year of famine, the wisdom of God. And guess what? The Bible says this. He became rich until his wealth and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. Very wealthy. Now there's no two ways to sugarcoat this. The Bible is talking about natural material things. That God had given, remember, riches and honor in the left hand. The world would say, you fool. Don't you know this is a year of famine? Don't you know that this isn't a good time to invest? Don't you know that this isn't wise? Don't you know it's, it's a foolish thing to do? But the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God for his child. The provision of God for his child. Who sows in a year of famine? But Isaac. On a side note, when the world calls you a fool, it's a good indication to keep doing what you're doing. Remember the man building the boat in the world that had never flooded? Remember that guy? Noah, what were they saying of him? You fool, what are you doing? You're wasting all your resources, you're pouring all your resources, you got your whole family building this boat. We don't even, what, what's it for? What's going to happen? The wisdom of God told him to build the boat. You fool, you're such an idiot, why are you dragging your family through this? Remember the army that marched around the city for a week? Can you imagine from the walls of that city what could have been said, what would have been said? You guys have lost it out here in the sun. The, the heat's getting to you. What are you doing? What a stupid thing to do. Keep on marching. That's, that's foolish. Why are you doing this? 
Remember the shepherd boy that went up to the giant with the sling? Am I a dog? What was, John, what was Goliath saying? You're an idiot. Am I a dog? You come after me with sticks and stones and a sling? He was saying, you're a fool. I'm going to destroy you. What a fool. Only a fool would come up before me. You remember a man or a woman putting his or her faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died on a cross some 2,000 years ago, who was put in a tomb and who raised from the dead. And you know what people say of you and they say of me? You're a fool. Hey, guess what? Keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing because you know what? You know what? Guess what? The people outside that boat realized when it started raining. I'm a fool. Guess what? The people inside Jericho realized when the walls started to shake. I'm a fool. Guess what Goliath realized the second that stone hit him in the head. What a fool I am. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't seek after the world's ways. For if we become like the world, why should the world want to be like us? Let me tell you something. The reason that God embraces you, that gives you wisdom, the reason he gives you peace, the reason he gives you riches, the reason he blesses you and honors you is so that others will envy you and want what you have. And here's the thing. What do you have that they don't have? Peace. Peace. How do I get peace? From God. How do I get God? You put your faith and your hope and your trust in Jesus Christ, and he becomes your father. And guess what? You can have the peace of God, and you can have peace with God. It's the reason we are given these things, so that we can be a testimony, so that we can be a testimony, so that many would come to know the God that we serve. Why does God bless you? so that others will come to him. Why does God heal you? So that by your testimony, others will come to him. Why does God give you long life? Why do you want to live a long time? Your answer should be, so I can bring more people to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's why I want to live longer. So that I can bring more people and more people and more people to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Well, pastor, we're supposed to be humble. We're supposed to be people who are, are full of humility. How do I remain humble? How can I do that? I don't think that I should be wealthy. I don't think I should have this much influence and, and material wealth and, and be humble. I don't think I should do that. How do I do it? Here's what I would tell you. Never fail to acknowledge the source. Never fail to acknowledge the source. It doesn't matter what you have or what he's given you. Whatever it is, you never fail to acknowledge the source. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you open up a can of ravioli and you sit down and that's what you have for your dinner because that's what you can afford, never fail to acknowledge the source. If you sit down and you have a filet mignon, never fail to acknowledge the source and invite your pastor. But you understand what I'm saying. You understand what I'm saying. Because if you always keep your eyes on God as the source, then pride doesn't come into you. He gets the glory for what you have and for what you can do and for what you can do to bless other people. And when people say, hey, thank you, hey, you help me out. Someone on the side of the road, you give them some money, and they say, hey, thank you, brother. Say, hey, listen, thank God, because he gave it to me to give to you. Always acknowledge the source. What's the source? Wisdom. Where does wisdom come from? God. It all connects together. You say, I am what I am through Jesus Christ. 
I have what I have because of Jesus Christ. If I'm the source, I become prideful. I become prideful. But when he is my source, I become humble. And this includes spiritual wealth as well. Spiritual wealth. What do I mean by that? I mean when God uses you, when he puts you in a position of of influence. He lets you stand before others and preach. He lets you teach. He lets you sing. He lets you lead worship. He lets you teach a Sunday school class. He lets you do any of those things where he gives you spiritual giftings in order to pour out into the people. Guess what? Always acknowledge that he is your source. He is your source. The Bible says, for unto whomsoever much is given, of him much shall be required. Much shall be required. And to those of you who God has given wisdom, we have, we have a lot of wisdom in this room. A lot of God-given wisdom. We have a lot of experiential wisdom as well. Wisdom that the world has. See, the world gains experience. They gain, they gain wisdom in some ways. The wisdom of God. There are people who have wisdom about how to, to do things financially, how to do things architecturally. The world, there is, there's a wisdom there. Don't get me wrong. There's a wisdom there. But it's nothing compared to the wisdom that God gives to his children, to those who hunger for his word, to those who seek after him, to those who search for him. And so what I would tell you today is to let wisdom embrace you. Let wisdom embrace you. Let her wrap her arms around you. Remember, happy is the man who finds wisdom. Her proceeds are better than the profits of silver and her gains more than fine gold. Length of days is in her right hand. Riches and honor in her left. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and life more abundant, length of days. He said, I pray and pro that you would prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers, riches and honor, riches and honor. Remember, it doesn't have to always be material like Isaac. There were things that Isaac had spiritually too. When you married that back to that when we talk about marrying that woman and you embraced her, man, there are riches and honor there that are not just material. Do you understand what I'm saying? That you gain from just embracing that woman. Men, you did, right? You did. All the men said, amen, you better, because your wife's probably sitting there poking you. But let wisdom embrace you. Ask the Lord for wisdom. Give me wisdom. Let him embrace you today and embrace wisdom.